Classics, retold by David Henry Wilson. Daniel Defoe, Robinson Crusoe. Long ago, before there were any planes or trains or motor cars, the only way to travel across the world was by ship, and the ships in those days were driven by the wind. They were in constant danger from storms, which could turn the waves into hills and blow the ships onto the rocks and smash them to pieces. That was why Robinson Crusoe's father was very unhappy when his son told him that he wanted to go to sea. It's too dangerous, Robinson. Stay on land where it's safe and become a teacher or a doctor. But Robinson wouldn't listen, and when he was old enough, he left home and became a sailor. For a while it all went well, until one day, as his father had warned him, the ship he was sailing on ran into a terrible storm. The wind howled and the thunder boomed and the waves swooshed the ship up as high as a mountain and then hurled it back down again until finally there was a terrible crash as it was thrown onto sharp rocks. Abandon ship, cried the captain. And Robinson found himself with a few other men sitting in a lifeboat trying to row away. But the sea that was battering the ship battered the boat as well and another huge wave picked it up and hurled it down again deep into the water. All the men were thrown out Robinson swam for his life. Fortune favoured him, and the wind and waves eventually carried him to a sandy shore, where he lay exhausted until the sun rose the next morning. By now the storm had finished, and the sun shone down on a scene of peace and calm. In the distance he could see the wrecked ship lying on the rocks, but there was no sign anywhere of survivors. Behind him were cliffs, and when he climbed to the top, he could see hills and forests, but again, no sign of life. He was alone on a desert island. From the cliff top, he could see the wreck. Clearly, it had not been smashed to pieces, and so he wondered if there might be food and guns and other items he could use. The sea was now calm, and so he swam all the way and climbed aboard. He was delighted to find not only food, drink, guns and ammunition, but also the carpenter's box of tools and a Bible. His problem now was how to get them all back to the island. As the ship was made of wood, he chose several strong planks and tied them together with rope, some lengthways and some across, to form a raft. This he pushed off the deck and into the sea, where it floated on the calm water. Next he lowered the heavier items by rope and carried the lighter ones down to the raft until it could hold no more. Then he made a paddle out of another piece of wood and set off for his island. After several days and several journeys he had a good supply of all the things he needed and so his next task was to build a home for himself. He had made a tent out of the ship's sails, but now he looked for a suitable place to put it. He found a flat area on the side of a hill from which he could see the ocean. If a ship came by, he would be able to signal to it and be rescued. Just behind where he set up his tent, there was a hollow space in the hill, and he dug into it to make it big enough to hold all the stores he had brought from the wreck. Next, he put up a fence around the tent just in case any wild animals should come creeping up on him during the night. And with wood from the trees in the nearby forest, he even made a table and chair for himself. He slept in a hammock he had taken from the wreck, and he built a special fireplace on which to do his cooking. How did he get his food? 
Every day he went out exploring different parts of the island, and he found lots of fruit and other edible plants. There were also plenty of animals and birds in the forests for him to shoot. These included wild goats, and as time went by, he captured some and built an enclosure to keep them in. They provided him with milk and meat, and he was also able to make clothes for himself out of their skins. Once he found an injured parrot, and he not only nursed it back to health, but even taught it to say words like, Robinson, and how are you today? The days turned into weeks, then months, then years. But he was not unhappy. He was king of the island, and he kept himself busy exploring, making things, writing a diary, and also planting seeds and tending his goats. He even made a small boat so that he was able to row all round the island when the weather was calm. But never in all this time did any ships come sailing by, and he wondered if he would ever be able to leave the island. Then, one day, he had a shock. He was walking along the shore when suddenly he saw a human footprint in the sand. The sight of it filled him with fear. There is no animal in the world more dangerous than a human. If there was one on the island now, there could be others. And although he had called himself king, he was in fact a foreigner here. He ran back to his home, tested the strength of the fence, and prepared his guns in case the native islanders should find and attack him. There he stayed for several days, but no one came. At last he dared to leave his little castle and go down to the shore again. The footprint had been washed away and he wondered if he'd dreamt it. But he hadn't. Not long afterwards he heard the sound of voices from the same stretch of beach. And when he crept closer he saw a group of naked people dancing and singing around a fire on which they were roasting large chunks of meat. Near them on the sand lay two small boats. When the meat was cooked the people sat down to eat, after which they once more sang and danced around the fire before dragging their boats back to the sea and rowing away into the distance. Clearly they had come from another island, but even though they had now left, Robinson was still afraid of them. There had been something wild about their singing and dancing that had brought a chill to his heart. It was a long time before they returned, but this time something happened that was to change Robinson's life forever. As the naked people gathered wood for their fire, Robinson noticed that two men were standing to one side. One of them stood with bowed head, while the other was upright and held a spear as if he was guarding the first. Suddenly, the first man straightened up and hit the guard with such a hard blow that he fell to the ground, unconscious. Then the captain ran away from the rest of the group and towards Robinson's hiding place. Robinson had never seen a man run so fast. By the time the guard had recovered consciousness and raised the alarm, there was a huge distance between the pursuers and their escaped prisoner. Now Robinson realized that he himself was in danger and must escape before the pursuers arrived, and so he took a swift decision. As the prisoner approached his hiding place, he stood up to reveal himself. The prisoner stopped in his tracks with a terrified look in his eyes, but Robinson beckoned to him and spoke in a very calm voice. Come with me. I'll help you. There's no need to be afraid. Follow me. He beckoned again. The prisoner looked back at his pursuers, then at Robinson, and made the decision to follow the friendly-looking stranger. Robinson knew the island so well that it was easy for him to elude the pursuers, and eventually they gave up the chase. Robinson took the prisoner back to the safety of his castle, and the young man knelt before him and kissed his feet, as if to say, I will serve you forever. He was a fine-looking man with long black hair and sparkling brown eyes which shone with intelligence now that the fear was gone. When he spoke in his own language, no doubt to give thanks to the man who had saved him, his voice was strong and clear. Robinson knew at once that he had made the right decision, and so now he had a companion. 
He called him Friday, as that had been the day of the rescue. And as time went by, Friday not only learned to speak English, but also to use tools and guns for making things and hunting. He helped to milk the goats and plant seeds. And when Robinson read to him from the Bible, they talked about different gods and how life began. They also talked about England, and Friday swore that if ever they were rescued from the island, he would go there with Robinson. It was a happy time for both of them. One day, Friday came running and shouting at the top of his voice, Master! Master! Big ship! Come see! Big ship! Together they hurried to the cliff top, and, sure enough, there was a tall ship standing motionless in the sea a couple of miles from the shore. Robinson could see at once that it was English, and the first thought that occurred to him was that perhaps, at long last, he would be able to leave the island and return home. Then Friday pointed at a speck that was moving across the water, and as it drew nearer, Robinson saw that it was a boat, heading towards the shore just a few hundred yards away. There were eleven men on it, but two of these were tied up. They're you countrymans? English? asked Friday. Robinson put his finger to his lips to indicate that they should keep quiet. The men were certainly English, but something made him afraid. Why were two of them tied up? And why would the ship have come here? They only went to places where goods could be bought and sold, and no one even knew that this island was inhabited. The prisoners were lifted out of the boat and carried into the shade of a palm tree. One of them must have said something, and a bearded sailor swore and struck him in the face. Then the rest of the sailors wandered off to explore the island. Quickly, Friday, while the sailors are gone, we must find out what's happened. They hurried towards the palm tree, and the eyes of the prisoners opened wide at the sight of them. They must have been a strange sight, too. The bearded Englishman dressed in goatskin and the tall young islander behind him, both carrying guns and knives. Tell us quickly who you are and what's happened. The man who had been struck was evidently their leader. I'm the captain of the ship, and this is the mate, my second in command. There are villains among the crew, and they persuaded the others to mutiny, so that they could take all the treasure we have aboard. They wanted to kill us, but some of the crew persuaded them to leave us on the island instead. They didn't want murder on their conscience. Then listen, Captain, if we free you, will you promise to obey my commands at all times? Yes, indeed, sir, and we shall be forever in your debt. And if we recapture the ship, will you promise to take me and my companion back to England? Most gladly, sir, most gladly. Then come with us. Robinson swiftly cut the ropes that bound the prisoners and then led them to a hiding place to await the return of the sailors. As soon as they arrived, Robinson gave the order, and the four of them sprang out, guns and knives pointing straight at the mutineers. Surrender, or we will shoot you, shouted Robinson. All nine fell to their knees at once and begged for mercy. Then Robinson asked the captain which of them he thought could be trusted, because he knew that four men alone would not be able to recapture the ship. The captain chose five of the nine, and Robinson spoke to them. You have a choice. Either you promise to serve us faithfully, or we will shoot you. If you serve us and return to England with us, we will tell the authorities that you helped us defeat the mutineers, and so you will be free men. Of course, all five promised to serve faithfully. Hearing this, the others again begged for their lives, but the captain knew that they could not be trusted. However, Robinson did not kill them, because he had other plans for them. Instead, he tied them up, left Friday and the mate to guard them, and then returned to his home with the captain and the other five men. There they collected all the guns and ammunition, together with a few of the things that Robinson wished to take with him to England. These included the money he had taken from the wrecked ship all those years ago, his Bible and his parrot, which greeted everyone with the cry of, How are you today? By the time they got back to the shore, night had begun to fall. Robinson told the captain and mate to put on the uniforms of the captured sailors, and he did the same himself. But despite his protests, Friday had to remain behind to guard the prisoners, 
because there was no way he could be taken for an ordinary sailor. Robinson had to reassure him. We shall be back Friday, never fear, and you will come to England with me. Then Robinson, the captain, the mate and the five honest sailors climbed into the boat and rowed towards the big ship. Is that you, Will? cried a voice from above as they drew near. It was the watchman, and by the light of the moon and stars, all he could see was the boat and the eight sailors. Aye, aye, responded one of the men, and all eight climbed up the ropes and onto the